Coming up on Stu Does America, I talked a little bit yesterday about the controversial firing of New York Times reporter Donald McNeil after his usage of a racial slur, but there's so much more nonsense to go into on that one. We'll get into that. And the ugly truth about Andrew Cuomo's COVID response is continuing to pour out. We'll speak to one of our favorite reporters who has all the receipts. Thank you so much for tuning in to our stupid little show. It means the world to us. Please take a moment to subscribe to our YouTube channel and to our podcast. Start liking those episodes. Just click all over the screen except for the thumbs down button. Don't click that one. It helps spread the word about the show and grow our audience and get the truth about people like, I don't know, Andrew Cuomo out to the masses. Just head to studosamerica.com to find links uh, to the show in all of its formats or get us a package deal uh, with the rest, of course, of all the content here at Blaze TV. Just head to blazetv.com slash stew and use the promo code stew because that's how they know you like this stupid show and you'll get 30 bucks off. To paraphrase the ancient philosopher Usher, just when Andrew Cuomo thought he said all he could say, his chick on the side said she got one on the way. Let's do Cuomo's Confessions. So after all that we've been through, I will make it up to you. I promise to. It's hard to say I'm sorry. These are, of course, the words of the band Chicago and also the Cuomo administration. The New York Post has a exclusive, yeah, and explosive report on a call between the Cuomo administration and Democratic lawmakers in New York. Cuomo aide Melissa DeRosa privately apologized to Democratic lawmakers for withholding the state's nursing home death toll from COVID-19. It's hard for me to say I'm sorry. Let me give you some of the quotes from the call. A great piece of reporting from the New York Post and Bernadette Hogan, among others. DeRosa, the Cuomo aide, says he, Trump, starts tweeting that we killed everyone in nursing homes. And he starts going after New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy. Starts going after California Governor Gavin Newsom. Starts going after Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer. And then Trump directs the Department of Justice to do an investigation into us. And basically, we froze. This is not my wise-ass explanation of what happened. This is the Cuomo administration explaining what happened to other Democrats. She went on to explain, quote, because then we were in a position where we weren't sure if what we were going to give to the Department of Justice or what we would give to you guys or what we start saying was going to be used against us while we weren't sure if there was going to be an investigation. That played a very large role into this. Got it? Trump started tweeting, so they didn't give the information to the Department of Justice because they thought it might be used against them. Hmm. Well, I don't know. Yeah, as well it should be. Your performance should be used against you. Yes, 100%. The Cuomo aide went on to say she was so, so sorry. But sorry for what? Quote, so we do apologize, she said to her fellow Democrats. I do understand the position that you were put in. I know that it is not fair. It was not our intention to put you in that political position with the Republicans. Cuomo isn't apologizing to the Department of Justice for lying to them. He's not apologizing to the Empire Center for evading a lawsuit to provide the information. He's not apologizing to the citizens of his state or at least the ones that are still alive. No, he's apologizing to the Democrats for putting them in a tough political spot with Republicans. And even when he does that, he sends one of his lackeys to do the dirty work. The man is an utter disgrace. And again, this is not my summary of these events. These are quotes. If you want a summary, let's get it from a guy who was on the call. Democratic Assemblyman Ron Kim. He summarized it this way to the Post. It sounded, quote, 
like they admitted that they were trying to dodge having any incriminating evidence that might put the administration or the health department in further trouble with the Department of Justice. That's how I understand their reasoning of why they were unable to share in real time the data. By the way, Ron Kim has some reason to be interested in this explanation, given that his own uncle died of COVID in a nursing home. All of this comes on the heels of Cuomo's own attorney general releasing a report showing that Cuomo had been undercounting deaths at nursing homes by about 50 percent, from about 8,500 initially reported to 12,743. Since that report came out, those numbers have been raised again and again. The Associated Press and the Empire Center have been trying to get this information forever, and Cuomo was finally forced to release it this week. Now we're up to 15,049 deaths in nursing homes. It's hard to put this number into perspective. Florida has a massive elderly population and has under 10,000 deaths. New York has 50% more deaths despite having 2 million less people. That would absolutely shock most of the country that has been eating up mainstream media coverage of Cuomo for the past year. New York has 50% more deaths than Texas, too, despite Texas having 8 million more people. But it's not like I'm just picking red states here. California has twice as many people as New York and still has thousands less people dead in their nursing homes. Andrew Cuomo is uniquely awful. And it's not just that he did a uniquely awful job, although that's definitely part of it, but not all of it. He's also been lying to the media constantly. Let me speak directly to reporters out there. Think of what Andrew Cuomo has done to you. He has been using you and lying to you constantly for a year about the most important story you have ever covered. He has tried to manipulate you over and over again to keep his media profile, his reputation, to sell posters and books. And he's tried to get you to spread his lies to your readers for his benefit. Allow me to give you just one small example here. We now know that New York has had the most deaths in nursing homes than any other state. We now know that Cuomo's policy imported over 9,000 COVID positive, excuse me, COVID positive patients into nursing homes. Of course, Cuomo knew that all along. We, we've been talking about it for a while. He knew this day would come eventually, where he would have to reveal these facts. Anyone honestly covering this story would know that he eventually would have to reveal these facts. It was just a question about how bad they would be. Cuomo knew these numbers would come up, but he also knew that until he released the actual numbers, it would appear that his record looked pretty good compared to other states. That tends to happen when you don't count, you know, half of the people who died. But Cuomo didn't just ignore the thousands of deaths he knew he would later report. He didn't just allow reporters like you to mistakenly believe that his performance was better than it was. He looked directly into the camera over and over again and bragged about how well New York was doing compared to other states when he 100 percent absolutely knew that he was the only state not reporting nursing home deaths accurately. If you look at the states and the percentages of people who died in nursing homes as a percentage of that death, uh, New York is number 34. First of all, we're number 34 in terms of per capita deaths in nursing homes. You asked about nursing homes. You take 50 states and you can put all 50. Where is New York? Number 34, you look how New York did on nursing homes vis-a-vis -vis the nation. Uh, we did better than 33 states in the nation per capita on nursing homes. You look at us vis-a-vis -vis the country where we did better than 33 other states. Then those are just facts. We're number 46 out of 50 states. Uh, so... Uh, and we had the worst problem, uh, and we're 46th in terms of uh, percentage of deaths in nursing homes. 
This guy used his lie to brag about his performance and made every last reporter who parroted this claim look like an absolute idiot. I begged for months for someone to ask him about this, and no one ever did. He went on TV, radio, and in print over and over again saying New York was among the best performing states when he knew he was near the bottom. And when it comes to the total amount killed in nursing homes, he was dead last. If you are a reporter, realize that Andrew Cuomo used you. Now, use that righteous anger you're feeling right now and use it to hold him accountable. If you want to buy or sell a home, you need a real estate agent you can trust. You need someone who's not going to, I don't know, lie to your face like Andrew Cuomo does all the time. It's not going to help you. You have an Andrew Cuomo real estate agent. He's going to tell you your house is you're going to be able to buy it for $4,000 and you could sell it for $25 million. Well, real estate agents I trust does not have Andrew Cuomo on their site as a real estate agent. He's not available to you. And thank God for that. Real estate agent I trust, uh, well, it's Glenn's company, first of all, so I don't think... I don't think Cuomo would want to come on, but even if he did, Glenn would reject him. Why? Because they actually screen their agents. They want people who are trustworthy, who have a good record uh, at their job, unlike Andrew Cuomo. I mean, Andrew Cuomo, wouldn't go, they'd be like, look at your job performance. Of course you're not coming on here. And we need a governorswecantrust.com uh, website, but we don't have that right now. What we do have is realestateagentsitrust.com. Get more information. Sell your home for the best price. Buy your home for the best price realestateagentsitrust.com. It's realestateagentsitrust.com. The story of New York Times firing a veteran reporter Donald McNeil is pretty wild, but you probably don't know the half of it yet. Here to fill us in on the rest is Aaron Sabarium, associate editor of the Washington Free Beacon. Aaron, thanks for coming on the program. Thank you for having me. Um, can we start here? I, I, a lot of the audience is blessed with the ability to not read the New York Times all that much. Um, so I don't know that they understand how big of a deal Don McNeil was. I mean, he was the biggest guy on the biggest story. Yeah, that's right. Um, and there's actually a kind of famous viral internet, uh, clip of him going on Rachel Maddow, uh, towards the start of the coronavirus pandemic and explaining in great agonizing detail what China did to contain the pandemic, uh, what we probably were not going to do to contain the pandemic and how bad the pandemic was going to get. And, you know, go back and watch the clip. It's from March. It's it's quite prescient. Um, and this guy was, you know, on the front lines of COVID from the start. So they basically fired their their top uh, coronavirus expert um, at The New York Times. <laughs> it's, it's remarkable. And he had been there for a long time. Yeah. He had covered Ebola yes. and HIV and many other diseases. And yeah. this all goes back to some bizarre, I guess, trip for rich kids with reporters, which is I did not know was a thing. Uh, but this is from a couple of years ago, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, 2019. OK, so he's on this uh, he's on this uh, trip with reporters. Someone asks him a question that involves the N word. He asks about context with this word, um, but actually says the word. That's essentially his offense, right? Yes, um, that's the main offense. You'll have people who will claim that he also made some other, you know, mildly insensitive comments. Uh, the examples of those comments tend to be that he questioned the coherence of the concept of cultural appropriation. Um, and that's about it. Okay. I mean, it, it, you know, <laughs> that's about it. Yeah, um, I was going to say, as I've done that many times, I definitely will not be working at The New York Times anytime soon. Um, but th this kicked off a pretty amazing internal back and forth. Some of it leaked publicly through media reports. Some of it you were able to kind of uncover uh, before anybody else had any idea what was going on. Can you kind of walk us through the, the chain of events here? Yeah. So, I mean, he was fired uh, or, well, he wasn't fired. He he resigned under, it sounds like, pressure, mm -hmm. um, pressure that was coming from other New York Times employees. Uh, the backstory is that they had investigated him shortly after this incident, uh, 
the executive editor of the New York Times, Dean Backwit, said, you know, he made an error in judgment. He shouldn't have said the word out loud, but intent, you know, intent matters and, you know, we'll give him another chance. Mm -hmm. Then when the report of this went public in the Daily Beast, uh, New York Times staffers signed this letter uh, complaining about McNeil and essentially asking for more discipline. They did not explicitly ask for him to be fired. Um, I think the only explicit demand was an apology, but they created this whole firestorm after he had already been reprimanded by the executive editor. Um, and after the executive editor had already said, you know, we're going to give him another chance. So if you throw a big fit after the executive editor has announced the guy won't be fired, it's hard to read that as anything other than a call for him to be fired or removed in all but name. So, you know, they didn't technically say fire him, but given the context, it was pretty clear that they didn't want him around. Um, and so eventually he did uh, resign technically of his own volition, but obviously under extreme pressure. Um, and then uh, when he did that, uh, Dean Backwit, and I think one other guy at the time sent this email basically saying, uh, well, racist language is not tolerated regardless of intent. Mm. Now, regardless of intent, that's kind of ridiculous. <laughs> right. It's really all about intent, is it not? I mean, you know, if, especially if you're a news organization, you know, the whole point of this, if, if you're quoting someone else, if you're these are all ways that these words, nasty words have been used. How are we going to know what someone said if you can never tell us what they said? Uh, these are ridiculous standards, and intent is always vitally important. Um, this, of course, kicked off a, a, an, another internal debate on, I guess it was, was it a private Facebook uh, page for people to kind yeah. of talk this stuff yeah. out? How, how does this yeah. work? Yeah, so there was a private Facebook page um, where people were debating this. And, you know, in a sense, actually, the what was in the Facebook group in some ways is actually kind of heartening because a lot of people were not happy this guy resigned. And a lot of people at the New York Times apparently did think that intent mattered and were not happy that Backwit had said it didn't. Mm. Um, so clear, you know, I, I wouldn't want to accuse the New York Times of being monolithically woke in its staffers. In fact, it sounds like that's not really the case. What's going on is that there is a group of people at the New York Times, um, maybe it's a minority, but it's a very loud, influential minority that kind of creates these pressure campaigns to get people ousted. Um, and other people, including you know alums of the New York Times and people who currently work there, aren't happy with it, but there seems to be an unwillingness to state that publicly because they're understandably terrified of the ramifications. <laughs> yeah, so it's definitely understandable. Yeah. I was I was amazed that you, you have a, a bunch of quotes from from this uh, in your in your piece it's called New York Times meltdown plays out in private Facebook group. Uh, I was amazed <laughs> maybe the best the best quote was that uh, was from uh, the Deb Amlin, she's the uh, the Times crossword columnist and she said that the 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 uh, the focus was too much on the perpetrator, meaning, I guess, McNeil, and yes. not enough on those he had harmed, which I, I was just fascinated to see that even at the, at the times, even the crossword people think this way, which is bizarre, though, to your point, there are some heartening po points in there. People who think just the idea that you have to take intent out of something like this is kind of in itself a racist concept. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, uh, that's right. And I, I, that was my favorite quote uh, of, of the ones I reported, the guy who said it was a racist concept. Um, I also think it's worth noting that w one of the people um, in the Facebook group who weighed in was a labor reporter at the New York Times for many years, and he harshly criticized the New York Times Union uh, for not doing enough to stick up for one of its own employees. Um, and I think that's uh, another dynamic of this that not everyone has sort of noticed that, uh, you know, uh, an institution that should be serving the interests of workers and reporters at the New York Times is effectively 
you know, if not actively pushing for it, then certainly they don't seem to be all that worried when uh, one of their reporters is fired yeah. um, or ousted. I, I think that's an important part of the story. And I feel like this is like a, a recurring sort of thing when it comes to these stories. Often, and we're seeing this with the, you know, the, you know, um, the Gina Cardano. Um, uh, uh, Cord- oh, I can't remember her name. Mm-hmm. Anyway, uh, the the lady from the Star Wars thing, Mandalorian. Um, yes. And so, and and you know, like I would love to see her co-stars step up and say, "Hey, wait a minute, this is crazy. How about the the actors' union, you know, coming through mm-hmm. and SAG and saying, "Hey, wait a minute, this is nuts. Mm-hmm. It doesn't seem to happen." And in this case, not only were there not a lot of representation publicly in his defense, he wasn't even really defending himself. I mean, how much of this is just Don McNeil's fault for not saying, look, I didn't do anything wrong. I'm not a racist. I'm not going to lose my entire career over a ridiculous claim like this. He just came out and basically said, I'm really sorry for everybody I hurt. You know, I don't I don't really want to pass judgment on the guy because, you know, it's a tough situation. And I, I think what's important to keep in mind is that the standard that was applied to him is not being applied to everyone there. Mm. So you can say, well, why didn't he argue back? Why didn't he say, well, because the people who were trying to get him ousted, they're not engaging in a fair fight, right? Right. Um, You know, there are other New York Times reporters who have said the N-word without bleeping it out, and they have not been disciplined in any way. Uh, It seems pretty clear that what happened here was that they perceived McNeil to be out of touch or unlikable, um, or a tad insensitive to progressive sensibilities. And then this was used as, you know, supposedly the ultimate example of that. Um, but it's not like this is some, you know, consistent principle that the New York Times mm-hmm. has and that they are playing fair and that there was some regimented HR investigation that simply dispassionately applied abstract principles. No, of course not. It was that there was an outrage mob and they bowed to it. So, you know, in that context, I I mean, I think you have to take that into account when you look at what he said. Yeah, then executive editors kind of come out and said, well, actually, no, we don't mean no in- right. intent doesn't matter at all. He's kind of backtracked on that. Right, um, right. But, but your exchange, I think, maybe the most important part of the story is afterward, you started asking the people who have been using the N-word at the New York Times in public. Uh, you started asking them, does this standard apply to them? Which is a totally rational question when you're writing a story about this. And I would argue they broke another major uh, rule of of journalism. They basically just doxed you publicly um, because of your question. Can you go through what happened there? Yeah, so so I don't want to get too far into that because I I actually think it almost distracts a bit from the real story, Mm -hmm. although the doxing is in some sense an example of the real story. And the real story is that Again, the standards at the New York Times are not being applied consistently or they're being selectively enforced, right? The New York Times has a social media policy that I think pretty strongly implies uh, that you should not dox other reporters. It says uh, (laughs) that, you know, you should always treat people with respect on social media, right? Right. Posting their phone number, that's not respectful. Mm -hmm. Um, But that's not really the point. The point is that certain people can get away with breaking these rules with no consequences. And likewise, certain people can say the N-word with no consequences and other people cannot. And the standards are not being applied consistently. Now, you can maybe argue in the N-word case that, well, uh, there's just some unspoken norm that white people can never, ever vocalize the word, even in the context of just referring to it. Mm -hmm. But black people can. I mean, okay, fine, but the New York Times did not say that, and I think that there's a reason they didn't say it, because that is itself not a terribly consistent or just plausible principle. It's not clear why you would think that, I I mean, it it makes sense that identity might determine, you know, whether it's permissible to say certain things in certain contexts. Right. You know, identity is maybe one relevant factor, sure. But the idea that it is the overriding factor above intent, that intent is totally irrelevant, that's nuts. And that's essentially what they said. Well, and and I will point out uh, that not only, I mean, the standards of the times are one thing. The standard of Twitter is really clear on this. I mean, you're not supposed to be posting people's phone numbers. And I keep seeing people get kicked off of these social media 
uh, sites for a lot less than what happened here. Uh, but you're being much more of a gentleman than I would be in your, in your circumstance, and I appreciate that. Aaron Sabarium, uh, he's from the Washington Free Beacon, uh, and uh, he his story is called uh, New York Times Meltdown Plays Out in Private Facebook Group. Well, well worth your time. Aaron, thanks for the reporting. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much. All right, back in a second. So how would you like to keep an extra $961 a year in your pocket? I, I would like that, even more than $960 per year. That's how much Gabby customers save uh, per year, on average, on car and home insurance. That's why when I was shopping for insurance, I used Gabby. Gabby takes the pain out of shopping for insurance. They give you an apples-to-apples comparison of your current coverage with 40 of the top insurance providers. And if you're like me, you're thinking to yourself, well, uh, you know, what do you mean apples to apples? I, the insurance policies are so complicated. What if I get a lower price, but I get crappy coverage and I don't even realize it? That's the best part about Gabby because you just basically can give them the exact policy you have. They can match it exactly and then they compare the prices for you. So they take out all that comparison work, which is the hardest part of trying to find a better insurance policy. If they can't find you savings, uh, well, then they'll just let you know that you have the best case. That actually happened to me. I went there. I had the best price. They didn't try to sell me on some other policy. They didn't know that I was doing commercials for them. I was just a normal person going through the system. And uh, they just said, hey, you got the best price for now. Check back later if you want. That's what they do. Gabby can save you money. It's totally free to check, and there's no obligation. Go to gabi.com slash stew. gabi.com slash stew. It's gabby.com slash stew. Make sure to use the slash stew part of the address because that's how they know you like this stupid show. gabby.com slash stew. So I uh, mentioned yesterday uh, that I'm no longer doing one of these big shows about masks. I did one, maybe it was two days ago. And I did, uh, you know, I went through all the science and all the studies about masks. And I'm like, I'm not doing another one of these. I've been talking about masks for a freaking year. I'm ready for them to all come off. So I do have a little good update for you about masks, I guess. Uh, They're coming off in Montana. Montana's governor lifts statewide mask mandate, saying enough vulnerable people have received the COVID-19 vaccine. I talked about this a little bit yesterday on uh, the News and Why It Matters, if you happen to catch that with uh, Pat Gray and myself and Sarah Gonzalez. Uh, it, was, it was a great conversation, and uh, we were talking about kind of like the acceptable uh, skepticism that people would have here, uh, especially if you're conservative, that we're ever going to lose these masks, or we're ever going to have any of these restrictions lifted. And I was kind of saying, I think we have a chance here, because number one, we, we are having, the numbers are coming down. We're, we were at 100 and, 130 or 135,000 hospitalizations about a month ago. We're now down to about 70,000. We're dropping very fast. Uh, that's number one. Number two, the vaccines are on the way. I think we're at 13% now uh, who have at least had one shot uh, when it comes to vaccinations. That's a good number. Uh, so that's going to be kind of becoming a piece. We already have a large chunk of the population, probably 30%, that has already had the virus and like are, me, are like me, a COVID-19 survivor. Um, but the other factor here, which is really important, is that there's now a Democratic president trying to say he wants a mandate for masks. And it makes it a hell of a lot easier for Republican governors to say, well, we Joe Biden wants it. Screw him. I'm, we're, we're getting rid of that mask mandate the second I can do it. When Trump was in there, like, you know, again, the, the, the guidance was not necessarily you must have a mask mandate, but it was there were a lot of these things coming from the White House and from the covid task force saying they wanted these restrictions in there. A lot of this stuff happened, obviously, when Trump was president and, and red states were very, very hesitant to, to push back. That was kind of the story of the Trump presidency when it came to Republicans. There was not a ton of opposition for the things he wanted to do, particularly as 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 the presidency went on. And I think these uh, red states are going to be like, well, look, we did this before. We're coming to the end of this. We got the vaccines going on. Joe Biden's telling me to do it. Screw you. No more mask mandates. We're, We're changing things up. So I think there may be a light at the end of this tunnel if you're in a red state. If you happen to be in California or New York, you're screwed forever. Back in a second. Wouldn't you like to get your credit score where it should be? I know everybody, uh, when you go to buy a house or a car, you think about your credit score. It's kind of the only time you ever do it. Well, when you're getting a credit card, it's important. 
It's also important when you're going for a job. Uh, as the economy is kicking uh, you know, back into gear post-COVID and the government's printing trillions of dollars per second, uh, you know, people, maybe, maybe you're getting a new job. Maybe you were out of work for a few months and you're going back to work. Maybe your restaurant is opening if you work there. And you're thinking to yourself, well, I want to get a, I want to get a job. Uh, they're checking credit scores when you go to get jobs now. I mean, it really, it's an amazing thing. Um, so your credit score really needs to be as high as it can be. And you can do this with ScoreMaster. ScoreMaster, they reverse engineered this whole algorithm. Everybody knows the basics about how to get a good credit score, but you don't know all the details. I don't know all the details. They do know all the details. You can enroll in minutes and see how many plus points you can add to your credit score and how fast you can do it. The average uh, person in the Blaze audience, I think, is averaging something like 61 points in three weeks or less. 61 points in three weeks or less. That's a lot of points in a very short period of time. Go to scoremaster.com slash stew. That's scoremaster.com slash stew. Make sure to use the slash stew part of the address because that's how they know you like this stupid show and you get your credit score higher. Why wouldn't you want to do that? Scoremaster.com slash stew. Even though it seems like Andrew Cuomo's chickens might finally be coming home to roost or to go die in their hen house, whichever, it's inexcusable the lengths that the media went to not only cover up Andrew Cuomo's crimes, but also to create a false sense of grandeur and power around him. Luckily, people like uh, Drew Holden are here to uh, hold the media accountable. Drew's newest Twitter thread is on his at uh, Drew Holden 360 page. Uh, it covers uh, this very topic and, as always, is completely factual and very thorough. Drew Holden joins us now. Thanks, Drew. Stu, pleasure's mine. Thank you for having me back on. Yeah, I appreciate it. I, I'm looking at your thread. I, you start it with this. The walls are closing in on Governor Cuomo. And, you know, I just don't believe I can get I can I can't have nice things here. You know, I just can't believe yeah. things yep. like this will actually happen. It does feel that way, though. It feels like even mainstream reporters are finally starting to notice how bad this has been. That's right, Stu. You know, I think what what really hit me this afternoon was on the CNN homepage, they have a story that says the story just keeps getting worse for Governor Andrew Cuomo. And I wow. saw it and I was like, wow, if you guys have gone from the Brothers Cuomo show mm -hmm. every night about how wonderful these two guys are all the way around to, oh, no, this is actually quite bad and there's really no escaping it. I think I think the walls might actually be closing in. I hate to say it. I hate to get excited at the prospect, <laughs> but I think it's true. I mean, I just want this guy to be held accountable because, you know, as you point out, they're in the middle of this, uh, the, the, the worst time of the pandemic. We're in March and April. He's got he's going on his brother's show all the time. They clear out a six year ban on uh, yep. Andrew Cuomo of uh, being on CNN with his brother. Uh, they let him have all these fun interviews They're doing prop comedy. I mean, they're carrot topping it out there. It's really ridiculous. Yep. And what's important, I think, to remember is that all of the stuff that's coming out now was happening then. It's not like he got yeah. worse. That was the actual state of events when all that stuff was going on and they weren't looking at it. Right. And Stu, you know, I, I'll tell you the truth. I didn't do a good job of framing this in the thread. But I think one of the important things, too, is this information, it wasn't just happening. It was out there. Mm. Right. There was some incredible local reporting from places like New York One uh, and other the ABC affiliate Eyewitness News. They're, they were hounding Cuomo about a lot of this stuff early on. You saw even some national outlets, places like The Post, The New York Times, right, New York Mag, these outlets who traditionally I certainly don't associate with uh, holding the feet to the fire of that many Democratic elected officials. They were running with some of this stuff. There was information here. There was so much smoke. And despite all of that, you had places like CNN and MSNBC who completely didn't just keep their eyes shut to those facts. They did everything in their power to talk this guy up as he's making terrible decisions that were leading New Yorkers to die. Yeah. You know, I think that that is uh, it's a great way of, of putting it because it it wasn't you know, I, I keep coming back to this and I I I. I I said this at the end of the monologue about Cuomo. If you're a reporter, don't you just feel used at this point? Right. This guy lied to them over and over again, manipulated them into writing stories uh, that were glowing about him. Uh, the entire time knowing that this information would eventually come out. I mean, this was again, they had this information yep. the whole time. Yeah, exactly. And that's the thing, too. You know, so I think we, we, we've just come off a four year period where uh, say whatever else you might about the media. They were pretty consistent in their approach to at least one elected official <laughs> to doing everything in their power mm -hmm. to finding the facts and finding the truth and, and being the bad guy. Right. And then I think that 
oftentimes the press is at its best when they are being the bad guy and they are asking the tough questions and they are speaking truth to power. And instead, what they've done is they've flipped that, right? And you see all of these media outlets who rather than do that, rather than run with the facts, rather than run with the with what is actually the truth, they construct their own narrative about what the truth ought to be in this case. We ought to feel like Cuomo is leading and he's courageous and he's doing such a great job despite all these difficult circumstances. And they just wiped everything else out that even their colleagues were staring at. Mm, it really is incredible. And I... This this might annoy some of my more uh, uh, Trump cheerleader uh, viewers here, but there is an incredible similarity in the way the the very pro Trump conservative media dealt with Donald Trump, uh, and the same thing that that the the mainstream media did with Cuomo. I mean. Almost exclusively what you'd find after when I bring up critiques about how <laughs> but a bad of a job Cuomo was doing, they would say, well, he just has this way of speaking. He has this way of relating to to us as regular people in New yeah. York. And it's like that's what everyone says about Donald Trump. And you get so pissed yeah. off about it. And they just couldn't see that this was going on the same way. Yeah. And he was when what else was he right? He was tough. Yeah, he was decisive. Mm. He was there for us. He's in the trenches he's fighting. He, he knows exactly. He's fighting for us. And it was it, it's it's I, I understand that it's spellbinding, right? It can be really easy to be captivated by individual personalities <laughs> right. as a conservative. The last five or so years have, have really, I think, shown me how powerful that can that can be. Um, but the fact that we were living through a crisis where there were still decisions to be made. Right. And I think the thing with Cuomo, it's not just that he like, oh, he could have done things better. Or I think a lot of the defenses are like, oh, well, you know, it hit New York so hard and it hit them early on. And how, how could they have known it's such a dense city? And then you start peeling back some of the layers of the information. Right. And you did a great job laying a lot of these facts out. It's the details. It's the nursing homes. It's the decisions that they made absent even a tiny shred of scrutiny from some of these major outlets that we're still going on in the thick of this while they're obsessing over whether or not the lighting is great on Cuomo's daily press briefing. <laughs> it's true. I mean, and look, I've made a, a very consistently uh, made the statement that Andrew Cuomo is awful. Dot com. Um, it's true. <laughs> yeah, uh, and, right. and in some ways, I think he's uniquely awful. There's a lot of bad mm -hmm. people have made a lot of bad mistakes. Some of them have been hard, you know, a hard situation for everybody. But he has been uniquely awful here, I think, continually because of his his is absolute disconnection uh, to the truth and any empathy in this right. situation. I mean, he's mm -hmm. done nothing but bl I mean, he's blamed God. He's blamed uh, Trump. He's blamed yep. every, the media. He's blamed Everybody. every single the New York possible, Post. New York Post, wh who, by the way, broke the story today uh, about uh, this. Uh, they're basically admitting that they held this back to avoid any critique from Donald Trump, yeah. which is that's not that's not leadership. He wrote a book about exactly. leadership. Mm -hmm. I mean, I. I I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know what what to even go to here. I mean, the media has been terrible on this, as you point out yeah. in great detail in the thread. But it's like it, I don't it's hard for me to understand how people could get fooled by this. I, I, I hear you. I, I hear you. And I think one of the big things, too, that's just absent for him is any even a shred of accountability. Mm. And that can be, of course, any elected official who uh, refuses to be held accountable. It's annoying. It's frustrating. I think people like you and I, you have to deal with it and the ramifications. Uh, it's very, very frustrating. Right. But the far more consequential reality is that it also means that their ability to make decisions is blinkered and it's bad. Mm. And so you end up having these these elected officials, these governors and again, in a lot of ways, similar to Trump, who are so fixated on what they believe to be the truth that the idea that any criticism could change their course doesn't it, it doesn't it doesn't compute to them. They can't possibly understand why that would be valuable. And so it wasn't just that Cuomo was insufferable and terrible throughout the life of this pandemic. It was that he refused to allow the tragedy and the consequences of his decisions to impact his future decisions. And New Yorkers paid the price for that. <laughs> Oh, there's so many similarities here. Um, let me go to yeah. uh, let me go to the media itself your, and your thread. You sure. highlight a bunch of big media organizations. Who stands out to you as the most uh, egregious? Yeah, you know, I think. Uh, Listen, we all know about CNN. I think we all we all saw day in and day out what, what CNN did. Uh, but I'll, I want to take it a little bit differently. I actually think that the worst contributor in all of this was was Joanne Reed, and mm. that um, her contributions were 
just so deeply sycophantic. They were so <laughs> narrowly flattering that hers, I think, were actually even worse, right? Because at the end of the day, you know, we, we, we can joke and kid about the reach of CNN or what have you, but she's trying to reach an audience of New Yorkers. These are liberal folks, a lot of them, right? And so if you're saying these things, like usually I, I would write MSNBC off, I think, from something like this in terms of really the most impact because they're they're so far to the left, right? right? Like I think a lot of people aren't looking at, at them as honest brokers, but I'm not actually sure that that's the case in this situation and that they were so, so terribly bad. Even giving him cover, I, I pointed out in, in the thread for the MSNBC post, they even gave him cover on the specifics of the policy for the nursing homes, right? And so when you start getting into those ones and you start seeing how, how terrible they framed it all along, uh, I think it's got to be MSNBC in terms of an outlet. And then in particular, it's got to be Joy Ann Reid. I gave her two entries. I, I hit my max for the number of tweets you can have in a thread, and I couldn't cut the second entry for Reid because was, there's was just so much there. <laughs> I will say, too, that's a remarkable statement considering Andrew Cuomo's brother is at CNN. So like, you're yes. actually outdoing... Uh, the praise from his own brother. That's remarkable. Yeah, it's it's something. Uh, and, <laughs> and it's disheartening. Don't get me wrong. But it's it is in its own way really remarkable that you could uh, that, that you could out suck up the, the brother of the guy involved in all of this. It's it's remarkable. Yeah, I, I saw a tweet today of uh, I think it was a reporter from NBC News who put like you know, it was one of those things that they're doing with the, uh, you know, how it started, how it's going. And then the, how it started was, you know, here's the book cover from Andrew Cuomo and how it's going <laughs> is, you know, all the new death totals and all these things that I think anyone watching the story knew was coming this entire time. Yeah. But like I found it re remarkable that this is now the public posture of, of many in the media. I think it's a fantastic thing. Everybody makes mm -hmm. mistakes. Everybody gets yep. blinded at times. I, I, I give them 100 percent credit if you're going to come out and admit that what, what, what went on before uh, was was wrong, though I do think it should be addressed. And I think I think the media needs to take a moment to look at themselves and say, what the hell were we doing here? There was never right. evidence he was doing a good job. He always had the worst performance the entire time. All the numbers yep. were always the worst for Andrew Cuomo. And we sat here convincing our listeners and our readers that this guy was God and we yeah. really need to examine our performance in this situation. Uh, that's right. And, you know, Stu, I think you make a good point. They had every excuse simply not to do this. And I think one of the best ways to do that would have been look at the people who were reporting out of New York. And it wasn't just the local outlets. I mean, the New York Post and the New York Times both had really, really solid coverage across the life of Cuomo's decision making because they're closer to it. They're in the weeds on this stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I, I definitely agree with your point. We got to welcome everybody to this table with open arms. But there has to be some measure of accountability to look back and say, listen, there will be crises again in this country. They will be covered by the media. And if we don't understand the ways that we're trying to honestly and accurately cover the people who a lot of us like, and when times get tough and when times are hard, if we can't have a conversation about how we can do that better, this is simply going to happen again next time. Mm. Drew Holden, uh, he's got the receipts, as he normally does. Uh, make sure to go to his Twitter. It's at Drew Holden 360. Look at that uh, thread, and there's always new stuff popping up. Uh, I, it, always worth a follow, and I appreciate, Drew, your uh, taking the time today. Stu, seriously, pleasure's mine. I appreciate you having me on. All right, hack in a second. If there's anything to take out of this episode, it is, of course, that Andrew Cuomo is awful.com. Get your merch at Andrew Cuomo is awful.com. A 90 year old in California has spent $10,000 to place two ads to AT&T and their CEO, an open letter that basically says my Internet service speed sucks. Can you fix it? Uh, he's in North Hollywood. He says uh, your competitors have speeds of over 200 megabytes per second, but AT&T is only giving us three megabytes per second, which, as you might uh, recognize, is awful. But this is kind of the guy, this is like, I want to grow up to be the 90-year-old that's just spending money just to, un just to harass people I'm upset with. Like, I get the wrong order at the drive-thru, I take out a $25,000 ad in the New York Times saying, bring me my cheeseburger. That's the old man I want to be. We'll see you next week.